Have your Bible open and ready for 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let me remind you, keep your Bible open and follow word for word. You'll get a lot more out of it, if you will, and it will be far more meaningful to you. Now, as we ended chapter 3, we saw that he had told them that they should abound more and more in love. That is a high valuing of others. And uh, they ought to have it toward one another as, as well as toward all people as we have toward you. To this end result, that if you highly value God and fellow man, to the end result that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God our Father, along with all of his saints. We're, we're established unblameable along with all other saints when the Lord returns to take us to himself in that rapture. And then he be, continues the admon, admonition in chapter 4 as to how they should live in having a concern not only for one another, but for others. Furthermore, or literally for the rest, for the rest of what I want to say, then we beseech you, brethren, uh, and exhort you, we're encouraging you, uh, in the Lord Jesus, in the Master Owner, who is Jesus Christ, the one that paid the ransom price to buy us back, that even as ye have received of or from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now when he says how you ought to walk, he's not talking about propelling your body forward by putting one foot in front of the other, but he's talking about how you ought to behave, how you ought to conduct yourself, how you ought to live your life day by day, and to please God. Now the word walk and the word please are both present tense verbs, which means you are to constantly live this way, you are to constantly, continuously, without cessation, please God. Now, he said so, or that word so, it's hina, a purposive clause. You do it in order that ye would abound more and more. Uh, you ought to please God in order that you would and you could continue to abound more and more. For ye know what commandments or charges we gave to you by means of or through the Lord Jesus. You know what charges and commands we gave you when we were there that came from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for this is the will of God. Now get this, he says, this is the will of God, not only for those believers in Thessalonica, but for all believers everywhere at any period of time in history. Uh, even your sanctification. Now, sanctification is our being set apart unto God. Now, we've been set apart positionally. We're in him, in Christ, at the time of our salvation. But there is that practical sanctification that we set ourselves apart unto God that we might live for him according to his will. So he says, this is the will of God, our being set apart unto him, that you should abstain from fornication. Notice the word should abstain. It means to hold oneself off from. To hold yourself off from fornication or illicit sexual activity. Now one may have the desires for these things, but he says, hold yourself off from it. You may have the lust in your mind. You may have the desire within your flesh. You may want these things, but he says, hold yourself off from them. You are willfully, purposefully in your own mind and in your own life, yielding yourself to the Spirit of God who is within you and saying, I separate myself from these things that the flesh may desire, from any kind of illicit sexual activity. Now, normally the word fornication speaks of sex activity of a single person, but as it is here and in many other places, it refers to any illicit sex, whether married or single, doesn't matter. In other words, any sex outside of a marriage is illicit. So he says, uh, hold yourself off from those things, that every one of you should know how to possess or how to control his or his own vessel. In other words, he's talking about your own body with your own organs that are there with these desires. So every one of you should, it's your responsibility, to know how to possess or control your own vessel in sanctification and honor. 
So you have it in an honorable position and sanctify yourself and set yourself apart unto God not to be involved in these kind of sinful activities. Uh, not in the lust of concupiscence. Now, notice that phrase, lust of concupiscence, or passions of lust, or impure desires. Now, lust of concupiscence. Here, he says, you're not to have these kind of impure desires, passions of lust, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, that word know is a perfect participle, which means who having not known and continuing not to know God. Now, he says a lot of people in the world of the pagan world, they live this way all the time. And he says the gods of the heathen were licentious, and so were the people who followed those kind of pagan gods. And one of the reasons for the revival of paganism in modern life today is that men wish to get rid of God's prohibitions of licentiousness because man wants to have what he wants. It's like we have in one of the other epistles that people say, well, food was made for the stomach and the digestive tract, so you take it. And so sex organs were made for sex, so you use it as such. No sin in it. It is a false teaching and a false logic that is being used there that we're told in the Corinthian epistles. Now he says to stay off of these lusts of these things. And back in the book of Romans chapter 1, I want to read a lengthy portion here, but it's very meaningful, and it's talking about God's judgment of mankind for what they had become, and we are returning to that kind of a life in our modern life today. Now, in the book of Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24, uh, he says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, that is, to moral uncleanness, through the lust or the passionate cravings of their own hearts. Because man rejected God and his ways, and they craved these things, God turned them over to them. To what end? To dishonor their own bodies uh, between or in the realm or sphere of themselves, who changed or who exchanged the truth of God into a lie or for a falsehood. And they worshiped and served the, create, the creature more than or rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. That means he gave them up to passions of dishonor or disgrace. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned, or they burned out. They were inflamed and consumed in their own lust. And their own uh, lust, that is, it's a, it's a reaching out in order to appropriate one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly or obscene or out of form or disgraceful, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or fitting or suitable unto them. Now, they received their own judgment in this matter. And even as they did not like to retain. Now, that phrase, did not like to retain, means that they did not approve of God in their knowledge. People with that kind of a life do not approve of God and the knowledge of God and the revelation of God from the scriptures in their own knowledge. So what happened? God gave them up to a reprobate mind or to an unapproving mind. Another form of that same word. They did not approve of God in their knowledge, so God gave them up to an unapproving mind. To what end? To do those things which are not convenient or the things which are obscure obscene, which are out of form and disgraceful, having been in being filled with all unrighteousness, being filled with all fornication, being filled with all wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, 
being full of envy and murder and debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. All of these things we are seeing rampant today in our society without understanding. They are covenant breakers without natural affection, and that carries a lot of information. Implacable, unmerciful, who knowing or who having known the judgment that is the righteous judgment of God, that they who commit, those who plan, promote, and practice such things are worthy of death. Now they knowing that, not only do the same, but they have pleasure. Uh, they heartily approve in them that do, that plan, promote, and practice the same things. Now, we see that there is a great revival of paganism in our modern life today, as is stated here in our text. For he says, uh, you are not to live in the lust of concupiscence, that is, in passions of impure desire, even as the Gentiles, which having known and knowing not God, that no man go beyond, that no man is to uh, exceed proper limits and defraud or overstep or do wrong, uh, that is, by taking more than one's due, his brother in any matter. So he said, don't overstep and defraud your brother in any matter that is in the sin of sex. In other words, don't take the other man's wife, he's talking about. Because that the Lord is the avenger. That is, he's the one who carries out that which is right of or concerning all such. All such ones that commit these things as or even as we also have forewarned you. We told you about this when we were there. And testified, or we fully testified concerning these things. For God hath or did not call us upon the basis of impurity, uncleanness or impurity. So God did not call us upon the basis of an impurity, but unto holiness unto sanctification, unto a separation unto him and to his instructions and ways of life. He therefore that despises us, despises not man but God. Now this word despises in both cases carries the concept of rejects, uh, rejects or sets aside. So he therefore that rejects or sets aside, rejects and sets aside not man, but God. Now, many people, because of me teaching this kind of a thing, they're going to call me nuts and old-fashioned and a fuddy-duddy and all other type things and push it aside as being out of, the, out of touch with reality and not coming up to the 21st century. But here it says, those who reject these type things are rejecting not me, but they're rejecting God who hath also given uh, unto us, or into us, his Holy Spirit. Now, God has given unto us as believers the Holy Spirit. That Spirit who is holy has come into us in the new birth or the regeneration. Now, he says, we have this from God, and therefore we ought to be in subjection to that Spirit of God who is holy. The word holy means totally apart from sin. That spirit is apart from it, so we need to separate and separate ourselves unto God into a life of holiness of living. Now, we cannot be totally holy because to be totally holy is to be totally apart from sin. Now, therefore, that's the reason we're told in Peter, as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all matter of conversation or conduct or behavior. We can be holy in our behavior and conduct. You see, we may not be able to prevent a lustful, sinful thought from coming through our mind, which means we're unholy or we would not have an unholy thought. But we can refrain from carrying it out in our life so that we are holy in our behavior as the children of God. And that's what we're called to here. 
Now, but as concerning, verse 9, but as touching or concerning brotherly love, concerning that, ye need not that I write unto you. You don't need that I have to write to you about these matters, of finding delight and pleasure in one another. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You've already been taught these things. God tells you to do so. And indeed, ye do it toward or unto all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech, or we exhort, we encourage you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you abound more and more in this love and concern for one another. And then he says in verse 11, and that you study to be quiet. Now notice that phrase, and that you study. That ye study is one word. And um, it means to earnestly endeavor, desire, to strive for, to make it your ambition to be quiet or in, uh, in meddlesome speech. To be quiet in meddlesome speech, to live quietly, don't meddle in other people's matters. And to do. Now, he says, and to do, that is a form of the word uh, prosentes, which is prosane. In other words, to meditate upon, think about, and to be occupied with your own business and not that of someone else's. And to work and to continue to work with your own hands. Now, it's out of other people's matters and work with your own hands. Now, it's amazing how much wisdom people have about other people's affairs and so little interest on, in their own. Now, he says here, you be quiet and do your own business and don't get involved in that of another. And to work with your own hands. Every man who is able should feel himself under sacred obligation to be employed in some way or the other. And I don't mean having a job for someone, but even after we come to the point of what we call retirement today, you still should be active in something that is productive and good for someone. Now, no one has a right to retire and live in idleness just because he has enough for himself and his family when he could be doing good for others. You could be helping others. You could be working through the church. You could do all kinds of good things for the good of others and the cause of Christ. No one has a right to live in dependence upon others when he's able to support himself. No one has a right for that as a child of God. But yet it is being purported today and put forth that we all have these entitlements to be taken care of by others even when one is capable of taking care of themselves. No one has a right to compel others to labor for him in order that he may live in ease and have a great deal more. And indeed in Second Thessalonians he said, if any man will not work, neither should he eat. And literally that says, don't let him eat. If he's not willing to work, then don't let him have any of your food. So if a person not going to work, he's not going to abstain from it. So it's our obligation to keep him from it. So he says, meditate upon, put your mind upon your own business and not that of others and to work with your own hands as we commanded or charged or enjoined you. We told you to do that while we're there. That, in order that you may walk honestly or becomingly. In order that you can walk and you have a, a walk in your life, that is a behavior and a conduct that is becoming as a child of God. Walk becomingly toward them that are without, that is outside of Christ and outside of the church. So as a believer, don't be a lazy slouch about matters. But do these things in order that you can appear as becoming and right and proper before those who are outside of Christ and the church, and that you may have lack of nothing, or literally, that you may have need of no one. Take care of things that you have no need of no one. A lot that can be said concerning this. But he drops now into another statement. Uh, we're to live a becoming life before the unsaved. Becomingly in good form. The unsaved have a right 
to watch the conduct of Christians in their business, in their domestic life, in their social life, in their politics, and in their righteousness of living. They have a right to observe our lives in every respect of life. And we are to be behaving in a becoming manner before them that they might be influenced to Christ. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, when the Lord, through the apostle, tells us that he doesn't want us to be ignorant about something, then it would behoove us to see and analyze what he's talking about so that we will know. Now, to be ignorant doesn't mean to be stupid. It just means not to be knowledgeable about something. I don't want you to be without the knowledge of this, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, he's not talking about someone lying down and sleeping. Uh, are asleep is one word. It's a perfect participle. Who having been and being asleep. Now, when the word sleep is used in reference to death as it is here, never, 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 one time in all of the scriptures does it speak of the soul. It's always of the body and always only of a body of a believer. Now, it's talking about the body of a believer that's lying in a state of death. You can analyze this. Take your strong concordance and check it out yourself. When sleep is used in reference to death, it's always in reference to the body of a believer, never the soul and never of an unbeliever. So them who are having fallen and, and sleeping, that ye sorrow not, or in order that ye grieve not, even as the others are the rest, who are having no hope. Now, don't grieve like those people that are having no hope whatsoever of resurrection of loved ones who have passed on. For if or since, that's a first class conditional clause, for since we believe, now since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do believe that or otherwise we would not be saved, we would not be a child of God if we didn't put faith and confidence in the fact that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin, he rose again and is now living that we might live as well. So we who believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now I want you to notice something here. He doesn't say sleep in Jesus. But he says, them also who are having slept. The word sleep is an Arius participle those also who having slept, all right, they've been lying in a state of death, comma, by means of or through Jesus, that word in, uh, well, it is dia, by means of or through the Jesus will God bring with him. Now, when he's talking about God bringing with him, when God's going to come and bring them, remember Jesus Christ is the full manifestation of God. Uh, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. So it's by means of or through the person of Jesus that God is going to bring them with them and Jesus is God coming down to the earth. Remember John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth who was the person of Jesus Christ. So it is through Jesus, that God is going to bring with him the souls and the spirits of those who, have, are, who are sleeping in the grave. He's going to bring them with him. Now, for this we say unto you, uh, in the realm or sphere, a word of the Lord. It's not our word, but what we're saying to you is uh, as a word of the Lord, that we who are living... Uh, that we which are alive, or present participle, who are living and remaining, the word remain is a present participle also remaining, under the coming of the Lord. So we which are alive and remaining, so the living ones and the remaining ones uh, who are living at the time the Lord comes to bring those souls and spirits back under the coming of the Lord, shall not, we shall not by no means, a very strong negative here, prevent or precede or go before them which are asleep or those who having slept. Now, 
In other words, he's saying when Christ comes to take us to be with himself, as he referred to in the last verse of chapter 3. Now, when that time comes that he comes to take us up to be with himself, we who happen to be living, or anyone that's living at that time, is not going to precede those who are in the grave. But he says, we're not going to prevent, we're not going to precede, we're not going to go before them who are having slept. Why? For the Lord himself, the Lord, the master owner, who is Jesus Christ himself, shall descend from heaven with or in the realm or sphere of a shout. Now, notice that word shout there. It's going to, he's going to come down in the realm or sphere of a shout, and I think it'll be a shout with a command to come forth. Now, the word shout is used in several ways. It's used in the scriptures of a shipmaster to his rowers to the oarsmen, as he shouts out commands to them. It's used of a military officer to his soldiers, shouting a command to them. It's used of a hunter to his hounds, shouting out to his hounds the command. It's used of a charioteer to his horses. Now, the word is used in all of these ways. So he comes from heaven with a shout. So in each of these cases, it's a shout of a command. The command of the rowers of the, of, the ship, of the ship, they're rowing. It's of the soldiers in the military shouting commands or commands to the hounds by the hunter or to the horses by the charioteer. And so here is a shout of a command to come forth with or in the realm or sphere of the voice of the archangel and in the realm or sphere of the trump of God. Now, the trump of God is used several times throughout the scriptures, and the trumpet is used as the Lord speaks in Revelation 1, verses 10 and 11. A trumpet sounds as he speaks, and there's a trumpet saying, Come up hither, in Revelation 4, 1. And then in Exodus 19, 16 to 19, the trumpet sounded before God spoke to the people there, and the trumpet called them to separation. And then also the, the trumpet, the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, at the time that trumpet is sound, we're taken to be with him. And then the trumpet at the coming of Christ at the beginning of the millennial kingdom in Matthew 24, 29 to 31. So we have the trump of God that sounded on several occasions in, this, in, this, in the scriptures. Uh, so he says, the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead ones, that word dead is a plural word, and the dead ones in Christ shall rise first. So notice he said up above, we who may be living at that time are not going to precede them or go before them, but they who are dead are going to rise first. Remember, the spirits are being brought with him. The soul and the spirit of the believer goes directly to be with the Lord upon death. The body goes to the grave. Soul and spirit with the Lord. He's going to bring those souls and spirits with him. The body is going to be resurrected from the grave. And they are going to rise first. Then we which are alive, we who are living, we who may be living and remaining, shall be caught up together with them in clouds. Now notice that phrase, shall be caught up together with them. That is a Greek word that is a first person plural future passive indicative of apazo. Arpazo is the word. Now the word means to seize. It means to take away by force. It means to snatch away. It's the it's to convey away suddenly, to transport hastily. Now, as I said, it's a future passive. To snatch up, to seize, to carry off by force. In other words, it's to rapture. Uh, it's a sudden swoop of force that cannot be uh, resisted. That is what we call the rapture, and that's what the, the word rapture means. It's a Latin word, but yet... The word rapture does not appear in the Bible, but the teaching of it is there as you have it right here. So he says, shall be caught up. That's one word in the Greek. And it's a word that means to being seized and taken up and caught away. 
So he says, then after the dead ones are resurrected and united with their soul and spirit that the Lord brings with them, then we're going to be caught up. We will be changed as he defines for us in 1 Corinthians 15 that we shall be changed to a perfect glorified body instantly and we caught up together with them in clouds. Notice the article V is added there. Not in the clouds that are out there in the sky, but we're going to be caught up together with them in clouds unto a meeting of the Lord in the air. Now I think the clouds he's talking about here is not the vapor that's up there in the sky for clouds, but it's talking about believers from all over this globe being taken up. And as we go up from the different continents, there's going to be clouds of believers. Those who have passed on and those few who may be living at that time shall have clouds of believers unto a meeting of the Lord in the air. We're going to meet him up there. And the souls and spirits of the, those who have gone on are going to be united with their resurrected, glorified bodies, and our bodies will be changed to a perfect, glorified body, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And so shall we ever or always be with the Lord. We'll always be with Him from that point. As we are taken out to be with Him, there is the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We remain with Him for the seven years of the tribulation period. We come back with Him for His millennial reign upon the face of the earth. We're with Him throughout that time. After that, we ascend back into heaven with Him while this world is destroyed and with the unbelievers that are left upon it. And then there's the new heavens and the new earth wherein we dwell with Christ eternally. So we're always going to be with Him after this point. We'll always be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort. Uh, that's a present active imperative. So he says, comfort one another with these words. Uh, that, that word, present active imperative comfort, is a paraclete, a form of the word paraclete. So be a comfort to one another in the realm or sphere of these words. Use these words to explain to those who thought possibly they were grieving because they died and not be here when the Lord returns, that that day has not come yet, and he'll explain more about that in chapter 5 as we go into it for our next study. But here he says, we'll be caught up together with the dead ones to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord from that time on. So therefore you can comfort one another with these words, knowing that you will be reunited again with your dead loved ones.